Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, Champion City Church. Happy New Year. These days, people are almost reticent to say Happy New Year's, right? There's so much trouble, you know, people think twice <laughs> about saying it. it. It occurs to me, therefore, what a great day to be alive, to be a Christian, to be in this world now. Uh, uh, that's what I have to share from the word. Here is some instruction that God has for us to be people who aren't just surviving and uh, maybe making it, you know, keeping a good attitude, but uh, thriving in, in this day. God has chosen that we're still here on this planet. We have life, and it's not to just sort of survive. It's a, it's a life to thrive. So uh, we've got a, 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 the Lord's given us a good, a good word to share. Trust you've, uh, uh, like Brennan said, had a good time with uh, those you love, your circle. Uh, I found myself in a swimming pool with three of my four adult kids uh, playing pool volleyball. We hadn't done it before, and it was my idea. You know, it was cold outside, and uh, at the apartment where I am, there's a pool. So, hey, let's, let's do pool volleyball. So I got a net and all that stuff. <clears throat> No sooner than get in there, like all three of them are lifeguard swim instructors and uh, uh, not presently, but that's their training and they've done it. And I've never taken a swimming lesson in my life. And I didn't realize to do pool volleyball, you had to tread water the whole time. <laughs> so they're trying to teach me the egg beater, the what, you know, and uh, <clears throat> it was a lot of fun. But I, I, I have to confess, I didn't last that long. Uh, what was I sinking? Right? Crazy, crazy idea. <laughs> well, um, we've just celebrated the Father sending Jesus. He came. He was born. He lived. He died. And then when he left, he said, I am sending you as the Father sent me. So I'm sending you. And <clears throat> so I pray the Lord would help us receive this instruction from him so we could be sent well. We would be faithful to that, uh, that calling. Pastor Dean asked if I'd share a little bit first before I get going about a recent trip to Benin. Uh, you support Salam Ministries, uh, who I serve with, and... Uh, this trip in October to Benin, West Africa, country right beside Nigeria, had the, the uh, invitation to train pastors there had been delayed a year because of COVID. But uh, no sooner than I got there, I had confirmation this was the Lord's timing. Uh, the uh, uh, pastors who attended the events were incredibly interested. I mean, they would have been anyway, because uh, in the northern part of Benin, which is largely Muslim, they are challenged, pastors are challenged to reach the Muslim majority there. But recently, uh, the jihadist version of Islam had been bleeding over from the north, Burkina Faso, Niger, into Benin. And uh, very first Sunday, I find myself in a service and a man, a university student, a fourth year nursing student, is up front giving his testimony of how he had been released that week after being held for two weeks by jihadists who took his motorbike, took his tuition, roughed him up. The family and church had thought he was gone, uh, that, that he, he wouldn't come back. And so this was an amazing day of, of uh, rejoicing. Uh, same week, again, my first week there, Benin, the country, uh, drew a line about three quarters of the way up uh, and said every, all foreigners north of that line had to leave. 24 hours notice, pack up your family. And uh, not just missionaries, but all foreigners, because through the American embassy, a credible threat had been registered to target foreigners. And so, you know, that 
sounds good. In one sense, it is that they care, but in another, it's, it's a uh, compromise to just admit that the jihadists have that kind of influence and power to tell the government what to do. So it's not a, a good early indicator. The people of Benin have enjoyed relative peace compared to Nigeria and uh, surrounding countries where there's been much more crime in the name of Islam. Uh, so these pastors were, were very attentive to the subject material. Liberty to the Captives, the uh, core curriculum that we use, which is basically helping those who desire to follow Christ gain freedom from Islamic covenants so that they can bond with Christ as disciples of Christ, not held back by the former, but able to, to cleave to Christ. This uh, curriculum focuses on that. So we had translated it into one of the African languages, Batanu, and uh, also uh, translated a uh, study guide to go with it, and uh, also a French edition of the same. It's a, it's a Francophone country. And so we printed, had printed a supply of uh, both books, in Batanu and French. And uh, the first week's training was for Batanu pastors. I was impressed with the maturity, uh, not only in how they cared for their families, a lot of families attended, but how they also cared for their retired, elderly, widowed pastors, those who had served. Uh, I, was, I was quite impressed. Um, I know uh, at the end of the training, uh, uh, the majority wrote their commitment that within six months they would take the training and train their leaders back home. And uh, it was special to see that uh, intentionality on their part. And, and then the following week, we, in a city setting, this time gave the same material to a French speaking group. Seminary leaders were there, denominational leaders, several Bible colleges, even a Fulani Bible, Bible school uh, staff were there. Again, very well received. The seminary was so impressed. They said, we're incorporating this into one of our core courses for all first year students that they must take this material. And so just, just very, very well received. And uh, sort of the crowning goal when we go to these countries is to find a field partner, someone who will continue to represent uh, the training, uh, provide the training for pastors in the country. Obviously, we're just introducing it. And uh, uh, there's, just like here in Canada, there's many denominations, many networks, geography comes into play. And uh, the Lord brought two forward, uh, a young 23-year-old, just graduated from an English major in university, uh, and another more seasoned person, and they will continue this work. That's our goal in each of these places where we're invited that uh, national leaders be raised up who will continue to offer this training within the natural networks, church networks uh, in that country. So thank you for praying. Uh, if you receive our peace headlines, uh, you would be familiar with some of that. There is a year-end report from Salaam Ministries and a poster at the guest services. You're welcome to help yourself to that and uh, go on the website if you want to receive those prayer updates. But thank you as a church for your part in this ministry. I would like to uh, start as a, a launching point for the word this morning in, uh, uh, in John. Uh, you know, the, the disciple John, the beloved disciple John, uh, had more time to write. He's the only one that we know of, of the 12, that was not killed prematurely. And uh, so I like thinking of his work as a trilogy, the Gospel of John being the first part, the epistles, first, second, and third John is the second, and the uh, revelation according to John, or given to John as, as the third. So we're going to spend most of our time in first John this morning, but we're going to start uh, in, uh, in John. And I've shared before that John 13 to 17 is this, this little package, uh, a summary of Jesus' life and ministry while on earth, and uh, everything to do with what it is to be a disciple and make disciples. And uh, in John 14, Jesus had said, you will know, you'll understand when I'm dead, 
when I'm gone and you're alone, uh, that the Father is in me and I am in you and you are in me. And that's uh, brought up several times. Uh, and in John 17, we, we have Jesus describing life. I, th I think a part of what is in my heart, you know, and, and if I was to give a title to this, it would be, it would be Faithful Lovers in 2022. Are you faithfully loving God and your neighbor? Uh, do you want to do better? Do you, do you want to live a year of being a faithful lover? Uh, you know, COVID's terrible. Death is terrible. Uh, but it's, it's a good thing that people are more conscious of death. You know, we've, it's easy to become accustomed to death, right? Um, you know, I guess 160 people a day die in the world, five, 55 million a year, worldometer numbers. Uh, you know, and, and so, irregardless of the percentage of the population dying for a certain cause, whatever the reasons, it's a big deal. And it's, it's grievous when you, you lose a loved one. It's, it's a grievous thing, especially prematurely or unnecessarily. It's a grievous thing. <clears throat> but we can be overcome by a spirit of death as well. And uh, so some of my, my thoughts spring from having the opportunity to, you know, relate daily with people in these other countries where death is... Death is uh, even more present than here in Alberta. Uh, I remember one country, Uzbekistan, and uh, I was in a crowded market. And, uh, you know, as far as this music stand is from me, stood a man and a truck backed into him and killed him right in front of my eyes. And more shocking than that, accident was the reaction of the people, which was calloused and hard. Uh, it, it, it was shocking to me. I'd never seen a human killed, you know, right in front of my eyes like that before. But the reaction of the people was astounding to me. So that's not a criticism of the people of Uzbekistan necessarily. It's just that you know, uh, whether it's unborn babies, whether it's people in war, you know, what we watch on TV, we can become accustomed to death. And I, 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 don't, I don't think we're supposed to be overwhelmed by that spirit of death. And I think uh, that we are to live uh, as God's people in life. We're to be people of life. So uh, the value of a human soul and that 160,000 souls die, leave this earth every day, ought to impact us, it ought to move us, it ought to sober us to action, calling on God. But at the end of the day, what are we going to do? We've got 2022 to, to live a life as a faithful lover of God, and who knows what God will do in and through each and every one of us to bring his life to people. Faithful lovers... Faithful lovers. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you. What's life? Real life is people in relationship with God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's this uh, connection. We are not just animals. We are not just mammals. We are people created in the image of God with capacity for connection, for fellowship, for intimacy, for a communion with God. There, there's no other created being like that. I suppose we could talk about angels, but we're uh, talking about what's here on earth. Uh, we are created, we were given life, life breathed into us for 
knowing God. And uh, I've shared also previously how, you know, this whole package uh, before Christ died, what he was saying was, you're, you're made to be one with me in my name, in my truth, in my love. And it's a rich insight, much more than being an apprentice. It's okay to use the language or term, you know, a disciple is an apprentice of Christ. Yes, we're students of, we're following, he does, we do as he did, that's correct. But more so even is this relational dimension. It's a, it's a quality of relationship. Uh, that, that uh, is, uh, is beyond being a student of. It's beyond uh, even being a follower of. We've been called into this intimacy with, with God. Jesus had also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, life is, is, is God. That statement offends a lot of people. Uh, and in some senses, it's understandable why it offends. None of us... You know, to admit there's a God is, is to admit we're not, <laughs> and, and that we, we have to relate to a living God. He, he is a God of truth, and if you admit that there's a God and a God of truth who is the only way, then it leads to admitting fault. It, it, it leads to admitting a failure to uh, be of that same quality. Uh, with Adam and Eve, we suffer from this estranged relationship with God. Christ redeems, uh, but the gospel offends. And this, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, people, people really didn't like him. And uh, it's the same today. Nothing's, nothing's changed in, in that sense. Uh, we, uh, we are called to be in relationship with God. Now, I want to point out verses 14 to 16 in John 17. They're quite interesting. I don't know if you've noticed this before, but it hit me recently with, uh, with weight. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So did, did you know that? You are not of this world. <laughs> so you can, you can look at your, 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 uh, the person sitting beside you or your family member and say, you are out of this world. <laughs> you know, uh, I think we know it, you know, spiritually, uh, do we live that way? You know, is it, is it who you are or are you of this world? Jesus said, friends, just as I am not of this world, right? We, we've just come through the Christmas season where we remember Jesus' incarnation. He came, he left. And here's Jesus saying, you know, I, I'm not of this world. Just as I'm not of this world, you're not of this world. It's, it's like that. You're not of this world. And this is really important because, you know, uh, it's, it's clear that we, we aren't liked. We, meaning... People who are disciples of Christ, people who just are in love with God, faithful lovers of God, are not liked by the world which rejects God. So, you know, it's not so much about people of a certain race, ethnicity, religion. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who deny the reality of God, people who are opposed to uh, God being who he says he is, uh, are in opposition to, to truth. So I don't, I don't think this should make us sort of be on guard of, you know, do you hate me or do you, do you not hate me? Uh, people are people, but we're talking about Satan, really, the author of evil, hating God. So just as I think God can love people through people, so Satan can hate people through people. And uh, so we need to, you know, 
you know, uh, I think we need to be like Christ. We know they hated him. Well, he said, you're going to be hated in the same way. So it ought not to trouble us. Do you hear what I'm saying? In this world, with all that's going on, don't be discouraged by that reality. It's not new to this century. It's not new to, uh, to this period of time. You know, it, it, there's a couple things that I think we need to hold together from this, and, and that's a reminder that we don't convert people. It's, it's important that as Christians, you not think it your responsibility to, to convert anybody. We don't, we don't convert anybody. We're not trying to convert people. It's, it's God's work to draw people to himself and open their hearts. And our job is to be available along with him and speak into those situations. If the Holy Spirit's prepared someone, great. And if he hasn't, well, it doesn't mean you just are, uh, you know, ignore them, but it doesn't mean that you have to uh, press in and, and communicate truth in that situation. I mean, you do as the Lord directs you, but do you see the difference? Uh, it is God who draws people. You're off the hook. I really think you're off the hook. Uh, you need to be full of Christ, Christ in you, and operating in the Spirit, and the things that I'm going to get to will balance what I just said. But this idea that Christians convert people is a... That's a, it's, it's, a, it's not a right idea. And, and, and if there's hate coming in the direction of the Christian, I think we need to also keep in mind that it's not really the hate of people. I don't think there's, there's many people in the world, even if they're, you know, strong agnostics or what, whatever the case may be, that would say they hate Christians. They're not going to go on record to say, I hate those people. Um, and then there's a whole spectrum. Really, what they hate is, is, is truth, again. You know, it, it re <laughs> if there's truth, then there's right and wrong, then there's an admission that, you know, you're on one side or the other side of that. It, it means that it, it, you have to evaluate, where am I in relation to truth? And that's what they hate. So, again, you know, don't take it personally. Uh, it's, it's not your truth. It's God's truth. But fully identify with him, right? On pain of death. Let's identify with, with our God. Uh, uh, he, is, he is the one we love. Okay, so that leads me to 1 John. And basically, I have three things to share that if you will follow, you will be a faithful lover in 2022. The first comes from 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You may do this already, but maybe you don't. And I'd encourage you to wake up in the morning and say, God, what would you have me do today? I remember Jack Hayford once was asked, you know, the famous uh, Foursquare pastor in Van, Van Nuys, California, what, what, what is your, the key to your relationship with God? He says, before I move, when my eyes open, I say, God, I'm yours. What would you have me do today? Uh, I remember uh, Peter Daniels, a uh, famous wealthy Australian, was in Edmonton teaching, and he had people in a side room after, and he said, I'll tell you the secret. And he told the story of one of Europe's wealthiest men who was a man of God, whose, who, whose claim for God's blessing was that every day he took his agenda for the day, went on his knees before God after spending time in the Word, and then he'd say, okay, it's yours. 
what of this do you want? And of these issues, what, how do you want me to address this? How do you want me to speak into this situation? And uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was on a conference call in a men's group with, uh, uh, oh, now his name's slipped my mind, uh, one of our former politicians here in Albert, Stockwell, Stockwell Day, and he said what he practices and has for his life is, is this thing of, of saying, God, I'm yours. What would you have me do? That's basically this first point here. From these verses, I, I see John, the beloved disciple, saying, we need to live in this space. You know, not make it a religious duty necessarily. Like we can, we can make spiritual disciplines religious. And I don't think that's the idea. But if you are one who loves God as his disciple, it means you are regularly saying, God, what do you want? What is your will? And it's not just in a passive, you know, like if you're struggling, I need your help. Or, you know, I've got this, this sin issue or habit. Uh, you know, how could you help me? It's in a proactive sense. It's, it's like my passion is, is to know what you want. What could I do? Is there something I could do for you today? This is uh, what a faithful lover does. It is someone who regularly, over and over, throughout the day, walks in that space. You know, do you see how it's the opposite of a lukewarmness? It's the opposite of, of passivity. It is, you know, love is intentional. And so this is a, what, what in this situation could I do? And it's totally putting you in what is his will, what is his truth, what is uh, on his heart, what would please him, what will bring glory to him, and that is your passion. This is uh, the opposite of hypocrites, right? Someone who says one thing, does another, which is the biggest turnoff of Christianity, I think. One of the biggest. How do you make disciples if you're a hypocrite? So it's sort of starting with being a disciple, right? That's at least half the battle. The Holy Spirit does this work. You be the real thing. See what happens. It's another way of saying it is, uh, is integrity. It's, it's doing the things that God would have you do. It's a, it's a practicing of surrender, right? This, I guess, is like the dying to self daily. It's... Uh, you know, and, and surrender's got a bad rap. A lot of people think of that as passivity. Hardly is this kind of surrender passive. This takes backbone. This means when it's hard. This means when it costs something. This means denying self. This, this is a choice for the strong to surrender your will to God's and say, what could I do right here, right now? What would you have me do? I want to do that. Right? It's, there's no second thoughts. Well, let me pray about that. <laughs> do I want to do that? If it came from the Lord and you're walking with him and you know that's his will, boom, you're doing it. Well, that, that's going to result in a maturity. That is going to produce the quality of Christ in your life uh, if you are quick to obey him. Uh, one of the uh, Ethiopian pastors that is a field partner with Salam is, uh, I, I may have told you some of his story before. He's the one whose father was an imam in the local mosque and, and uh, let's see, I gotta come up with a name because it's hard to tell the story if I don't use a name. So I'll call him, I'll call him Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad uh, found Christ in his early 20s and radically changed his life and he's in ministry today. Um, his brother, one of his brothers said, when your dad dies, our dad, when our dad dies, I'm coming to get you with a machete on the day he dies. No, I'm coming. And <clears throat> so in November, uh, I've walked with this brother, Muhammad, 
for about three years now. And uh, actually, he's one of four that are going to be a part of online training with me this week. I get to, to hang out with them. Uh, a little, little tough to go there and eat with them, which is obviously what they wanted. So we're doing it online. Mohammed said, uh, in November, another one of his brothers made a decision for Christ. The first sibling of Muhammad's family has made a decision for Christ, publicly baptized in water. And uh, I, I share that just uh, because, you know, I've sat in Muhammad's home, met his wife, his children, and I, I, I get how, as a man, you could say, you know, I'm going to serve the Lord. doesn't matter if someone's, you know, got this death threat over me. I, I get that as a, as a man. But with children, I find it harder, with wife and children. And I, and I asked him, I said, you know, don't you have days where you're anxious for your family's safety? Knowing your brother's out there, and I've, I've met his parents as well. They, they are old. <laughs> so it's any day. And he said, no. Uh, it's, it's not my, my choice. God found me. I'm his. And he's got this. You know, it's, uh, you know, through a translator, right? And that's my paraphrase. He, uh, he just has crossed over. It, it, I'd say he's not of this world. He's surrendered. And he knows God's calling is on his life. And he just continues. So we may not be, you know, in that kind of a situation. But same thing. That's what it means. When, when John says, uh, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. It's with that kind of surrender. My life is not my own. My life is his. Uh, if you practice this in the course of this year, on a regular basis, you will continue to change. You will continue to experience the transforming power of God in your life and in your circumstances. And practically... You know, there are grow groups here at this church. Some of the things, a lot of the things, maybe most of the things in life, we were not meant to, to tackle alone. We need to be in fellowship with others. Some issues more than others, but if there isn't a vulnerability in our lives, if there isn't, uh, you know, a, an accountability, if there isn't, you know, someone to, to share uh, with, then uh, we're, we're vulnerable. This wasn't meant to be. So while, you know, we're talking about something beyond Bible studies, Bible study is a key part of discipleship, we're talking about application, being a doer of the word. So let's do together. Let's, uh, let's find those people and, uh, and walk with them. Yeah. The second is in the next chapter, and I'm, I'm really just, you know, I'd love to read the whole book, but we don't have time. So, 1 John 3, starting at verse 13, I, I see another clear instruction for us for 2022. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Yeah, you know, I think it's easy in life to get cynical. I remember <laughs> at a youth camp, it was likely a children's camp, but maybe youth camp at Sylvan Lake, 
my family had a cabin there and one altar service went really late, like midnight, and dad came looking for me. And uh, I would have been maybe 12. Yeah, so I guess whatever that is, junior high, uh, 13. And I, and I said, Dad, how come there weren't any adults up there? You know, crying their eyes out before the Lord, repenting, experiencing God. And his, his answer was, well, it seems that a lot of people get, get crusty. Life is tough. And uh, that stuck with me. You know, it's, it's really simple. But I asked a serious question, and he gave me his best answer. And I, 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 I uh, today, right, I had my 62nd birthday last week. Uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be crusty. I don't want to be like that. I want to be someone who's tender before the Lord, someone who has feelings, someone who doesn't become, you know, cynical with life. And there's lots to become cynical about. That's why people get cynical. <laughs> uh, well, I don't think the world is attracted to cynical Christians. Right? People who don't believe in God, they just haven't experienced God, aren't attracted to a God that's, you know, crusty. <laughs> so, my, my thought here is, is this, I, I, think, I think a key to, to have a gentle heart before God is, is humility, the practice of, of humbling ourselves. Right? It's like, it's easy to look at stuff and become judgmental. You know, 2021 was quite a year. And, uh, you know, I, like, like you, you know, we all watched in Canada as these unmarked graves were found. And uh, the pain, a lot of the pain that a lot of our fellow Canadians experienced came out. You know, I, I, I was particularly... Uh, uh, dismayed over the, the burning to the ground of, of the St. Jean Baptiste in uh, just north of the city here, Morinville. And, uh, you know, you know, my grandpa was in his mid 20s, married four little boys in Volhynia, 1910. Had a dream. War's coming get out. He believed it, and they fled to Saskatchewan. 1914, Germany declared war on Russia, and great-grandpa, you know, as a German settler, didn't want to fight for the Russians, which is where Volhynia was then. Now it's Ukraine. So they shipped them off to Siberia, and great-grandpa and great-grandma never made it through the first winter. So, you know, Europeans that came to Canada, like today, people who come here looking for a better place, largely, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And I remember now, my dad is the youngest of seven boys, and a girl took over my grandpa's homestead, 1,200 acres, and I remember my sister and me walking out you know, one summer day, and this would be like seven or eight years old, and uh, lo and behold, in this virgin pasture were tent rings, we're finding arrowheads, and uh, we learned the story. Because of a natural spring, this was, this was a place that First Nations people had lived on for some time, and the story goes on. Louis Riel in the late 1800s even was fighting on behalf of these very people uh, to have, have their own place. So, making disciples in Canada. You know, we, one of the board members at Salaam Ministries is a First, Na First Nations uh, woman. And I've, I've sat at and talked at length with her and her parents, who both were residential school survivors, about all of that. And, you know, like in many other things, we can, we just have to say, 
sorry. You know, where, where things that were wrong were done, especially in the name of the church, they were wrong. That's wrong. And we don't do that. We, we, we stop that. We take steps against those kinds of things happening again. That's, that's all you can do. Well, maybe there's more than that that you can do. But there, there is an overreaction, like in the case of the Pope calling a holy jihad against Muslims, you know, and then people being sent out with the cross on crusades and killing in the name of the cross, right? That's wrong. And the overreaction is the catechism today says that the God of the Muslims and the, and the Christians worship the same God. That would be, you know, an appeasement, a syncretism to try to counter, you know, bend over backwards to a fault in, 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 in order to give reparations. Well, that's wrong. So, so we, we love, we have understanding, we're honest, we take responsibility for what part we can, and we, we love, we continue to love. And that's where it maybe gets harder, is if, if there is a party that is difficult to love, well, that's where this really applies, right? It's easy to love those that are easy to love, but it's hard to love those that are hard to love. And uh, we're to love. So, you know, uh, Jesus is not a respecter of persons, and we can't be either. You know, because, because there are countries where Muslims routinely kill Christians, we can't hate Muslims. We need to love Muslims. And on and on and on we go. People are of great worth, irrespective of who they are. They have intrinsic value. They are of great value. And we've, we've, we've got to figure this out. I was uh, in this Batanu pastor situation. It was a rural Bible school, and uh, I was doing one of the sessions about the importance of forgiving, you know, that to, to experience a release from the Islamic covenants, Islamic spirit, in leaving Islam to become one with Christ, we needed to forgive the aggressor, any harm that had been done, any violence, any abuse, uh, spiritual abuse, any, uh, anything that was wrong, we need to forgive. And he stood up, and this pastor stood up and said, you know, can we really expect our people to do that when, you know, they've killed family members, when this has happened? Is it really, is it really? And, and then he was sort of sheepish, and, you know, I, I gave sort of the expected answer, you know. Um, and he came to me after with his phone, I left my phone down there, and he says, uh, Pastor Nelson, the reason I stood up, Norm, I, I know that we need to forgive just as Jesus has forgiven us, but I had just looked at this video, and he plays a video of a beheading that happened two days earlier that his evangelistic team emailed him, and he had just watched it. And I don't think, don't go looking for that stuff. These days, you can't find it. They take it off really quick. It didn't used to be that way, but it still makes me sick. I grew up on the farm, you know, and <laughs> it's, 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 it's uh, grievous. Yes, we need to forgive. That doesn't mean restore trust. That doesn't mean we don't, you know, uh, look at who the person is. But we cannot be a people who hold any grudges. We cannot be a people who hang on to unforgiveness. It destroys us. It, it, it doesn't allow us to be a disciple. Because <laughs> a disciple is one with Christ in his name, in his truth, in his love. How can we be one with him if we're hanging on to bitterness and resentment and offenses? We have to forgive. So that's a, a, a necessary ingredient to love, to love another. Yeah. Where is it hardest for you to love? You know, it should, it, we should be best at it where it's most important. You know, our first areas of priority. One thing I've learned is that uh, we can make family an idol. And it's possible to love to a, uh, to a fault in the sense of compromising our own personal integrity or sense of right and wrong in the 
name of love, you know, in the name of keeping peace or unity. And that, that can be wrong. If there's, you come to an impasse of some kind in the home, it's necessary to drill down on that. Don't just keep going. Stop and figure it out. Get the help necessary to uh, truly love. Love does not mean crossing your own personal boundaries. Uh, if you heard of Love Edmonton, uh, recently become involved with this ministry again. It, if you can believe it, uh, uh, I, was, I was a part of the start. I gotta tell you this funny story. To me, it's funny. In, in, uh, I came back from two years in Africa in 82, and I was 22, and uh, went over to West Edmonton Mall, and I was overwhelmed with materialism. And I said, God, what should the church's response to this be? And the idea of a chapel in the mall was born. And so then, two years later, I'm before the Gurmesians and, you know, trying to convince them they needed a chapel in the mall. Of course, I was wanting it free. And uh, it's a good thing they didn't say it was free because then we would have had to do, you know, what a, what a, a, a hotel chapel would do. And, uh, but it happened. And it, it started in uh, 85 and opened officially in 86. And uh, I was trying to think, who could we have as a guest speaker? And I was keen on Lorne Cunningham in those days, the founder of YWAM. So I wrote him. And uh, I, 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 I uh, Daniel 11.32 uh, was one of the verses in my mind. Uh, I don't think that's quite right. Uh, but it was about... The theme was, in West Edmonton Mall, we need to know God and make him known. And I used that in my letter to Lauren Cunningham to say, come and be the, the uh, keynote speaker for our opening dedication. Well, I didn't know, but that was YWAM's tagline then, at that time. It may still be today. He thought I was with YWAM. <laughs> And I wasn't, but he came all the way from Hawaii to speak at Marketplace Chapel's opening uh, because of that tagline. Well, today, that, chap that ministry continues, and it's Love Edmonton. And the vision now is not only for the shoppers and hotel guests of West Edmonton Mall, but that there be community chaplains on every block in Edmonton. Every high-rise has a community chaplain. And, you know, I mean, that can be you and me, right? It's, it's the disciples of Christ being intentional. You, you, you are in a certain place. Are you walking and praying for those people? Are you, are you in the playground meeting the people? Are you the one who they would come to when I need help? Are you compassionate? Are you generous? Are you showing acts of kindness? I mean, uh, we, we can do this. Uh, it's, these kinds of things are going on in our city and you can be a part of it. And uh, uh, this is what I understand Christ asking us to do, to be a faithful lover. It means we stop, we look, we think, what, who can I love right now? And in this situation where it's difficult, Lord, help! <laughs> How do I love? How would you have me love? in this situation. My last one is, is chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, so I've said to be a faithful lover in 2022 involves, what do you want me to do? Surrendering your will, following him. Secondly, how can I love? Who am I, how do I love in this situation? And thirdly, I'm saying here from 1 John that we need to be, uh, we need to be comfortable 
in, in the spirit of truth. I don't think we're supposed to be anxious about all the deception. You know, I mean, this, in this information age, everybody, it's so honest all the time about fake news, et cetera, et cetera. What do you believe? Who, who do you trust? And uh, that can create an overwhelm, a sense of, you know, impasse. And I don't think that's where we are. We are not that people. We are a people who knows what, what we believe. And it doesn't, doesn't mean an arrogance. It doesn't mean, you know, I've got the answer for you. It means we are comfortable to know God and know truth. And we don't have to be apologetic about that to anyone. We, we don't really have to be defending it in, a, in some senses. In, in the sense of just being comfortable in your own skin of truth. Christ being in us. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We, we should be very comfortable there. Get rid of the stress of who knows what to believe. Get rid of the stress of fake news. Right? You, you know the truth. <laughs> that isn't something to tout or wave in the face of anyone, no. But you need to be good there. That's a good place to be. Enjoy it. You are blessed. Grow in that. Let that grow in you. We are to be people of sound mind, sound judgment, the opposite of confusion and fear. Hmm. I just, uh, a few weeks ago, got this testimony. Our field partner in India lost her mom. Uh, it's a pastor couple, and they're a young couple with young children, and uh, uh, her father is a former Muslim, so this woman, pastor, did not grow, as, grow up as a Muslim, but she experienced a lot of the traumas of Islam in her part of India. You know, India is the third largest Muslim country, something that's hard for us to take in just by sheer numbers. India is a Hindu country by majority, but the third largest number of Muslims reside in India. And uh, I knew she had led her housekeeper to Christ, but I didn't know this. And she had, she had her, her housekeeper write out her testimony. Usually I get these testimonies third party. You know, and a pastor is telling me, this is what happened. So uh, I'll, I'll try and in, uh, explain some of it because it's, it's uh, in her, her own uh, words. My name is, I am a Muslim, which means she was a Muslim. I was married at a very young age. I have two sons. My husband was very cruel to me. He is not a doer of any work, meaning he, doesn't, he didn't do a job. Yet, he was beating me up every day. He planned to kill me one day. Then our uncle picked me up from there along with my kids. I do not know where to go. I didn't know where to go. Our mom also had an affair with another man after our dad died. Since our mother was with him, she did not join me in this difficult time. So, our uncle, who rescued me that day, is already separated from his three wives and was living alone. He was the age of a father to me. But he joined me, so I continued to live with him at that unknown age, which I think means young age. But I never married him. I started living in sin without marrying him. But I did not know then that it was a sin because many of our families continue to lead similar lives. My uncle also started dominating me. He would do things like torture and beat me. He would mentally torture me into not letting anyone meet me. One day while this was going on, I started working at this pastor's house as a helper in their household. So one day I came to know about Liberty to the Captives. Here, Liberty to the Captives training was done for pastors in our area. Coming to church occasionally, I was interested in this subject. I started doing those prayers secretly without knowing, without knowing to my uncle, without my uncle knowing. I started doing these prayers after realizing how sinful life I was leading and in what kind of bondages am I in. For a while after praying, suddenly the fear in me was gone. I was so scared when our uncle came home that I was, now I was no longer scared. To me, the torture coming from near him stopped. 
an unknown courage took hold in me. I later realized that I had this courage through the word I was hearing in the church and the principles that I had learned. For a while, I was completely free from the forces of evil. I was subjected to sorcery, and six evil spirits were sent into me. But by the great grace of God, I got perfect deliverance. Even our uncle, who saw the change in me, accepted the Lord. We were both baptized. This change started after the Liberty of the Captives prayers I did, which I realized later. I realized later that the change started with those prayers. The gradual and sustainable changes that have opened me up in Christ today. My name is now, and I can't pronounce it, means the gospel of the light. Now we both live perfectly with God's peace. I, know, I now realize how dark my race is in, I mean in religion, I think, is not being able to find the true God. The burden of my people is on me. I am also sharing the truths I have learned with all of them. All glory be to God. Thanks so much for getting Liberty the Captives to us. Amen. Uh, It's just an example, a recent example, of, of uh, the importance of the truth, right? You know, we can, we can pray the sinner's prayer, now you are saved. But if we don't walk in that truth, bondages can persist. And we see people 10 years in Christ who have things which continue to dominate their lives or a lack of fruitfulness and wonder why. Well, the best thing we can do for the body of Christ is to walk in the truth ourselves. How can I walk in the truth today? How, Lord, help me discern. Test the spirits. <laughs> I don't think it means walking around with a, you know, a furrowed brow, you know, but, but it means uh, this isn't like a secondary kind of a thing. It's a primary instinct. You're not of this world. Yet you're in this world. We need to discern people who know the truth. There's a great need for truth in our communities today. A great need. So let's walk as Jesus walked. Let's love as Jesus loved. Let's speak truth as Jesus spoke truth. Let's make disciples by being disciples. Let's be faithful lovers of God in 2022. Would you stand with me, please? I want to just close with these words from from the end of that book, 1 John. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. The evil one does not touch you. That's what the Spirit of God says to you who are in Christ. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Sometimes we need to just remember the things that we know, like an investigator. What do we know? There's what we know. Lord, would you please work in each of our lives to your purposes. Thank you so much for bringing us back into a whole relationship with you. Our hearts are broken as we look at our world. So much confusion and strife and trouble. But you've chosen to have us here now. Please, take us, use us for your glory in this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. For more content, hit subscribe and make sure to follow us on social media. You can also visit championcitychurch.com for more information.